Self Advocates United as One presents Connect and Create, Let's Plant and Grow. In the picture is SAU One founder, former vice president and advisor, Carolyn Morgan. Welcome everyone to today's Connect and Create, Let's Plant and Grow presentation. Today's presentation was with Power Coach Gabriel, Chris Moore, Power Coach from Hatsboro is going to be going through this with us today. My name is Christine Brakestone and I'm the Western Regional Coordinator for Self Advocates United as One. I live in Venango County and I'm also a Master Gardener. So Chris, go ahead and let's get started. Thank you very much, Christine. Good morning. Uh, my name is Christopher Moore, and I will be taking over for Gabriel, who is supposed to present today. I am an ambassador for Self-Advocates United as One. So the materials you'll need for this presentation will be peat pellets, a large bowl, three to four cups of warm water, pencil, and a marker. So go ahead and get your materials together. So Self-Advocates United as One has had a mission since 2007 to support the self-advocacy of people with disabilities for, for the positive impact in our communities and in people's lives. And the picture you see down below is of our staff and board meeting of the fall of 2018. This event today is a project of Self Advocates United as One for our Connect and Create project. And today we'll be talking about plant and grow. Today, we are planting seed paper into peat pallets. This will take up 15 minutes for your peat pellets to grow. And what you want to do is put your peat pellets with the whole side up in a large bowl or a deep dish. But here's the fun part. We cover the pellets with warm water up to one cup per pellet. This will expand and be ready to plant later on. And we will pour off or add extra water later. So let's go ahead and do that together. So go ahead and get your water and your peat pellet. You can do both or one. Um, just make sure your container's big enough that it'll hold enough water for both peat pellets if you do two. And then I'm just using a Parmesan cheese container. You could use any type of dish. You can use something nice, pretty, or it could be just something that's functional. And you're gonna pour about a cup of water over top of your peat pellet, put the whole side up. So it's just floating around in there for now. And we're just gonna set that in there and set it aside because we're gonna use it in just a little bit. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so why are we talking about gardening? What do you guys think? Why garden? Why do you think it, we want to have a conversation about gardening today? Does anybody have any ideas on why, why people garden or why we should talk about gardening? Okay, Chris, tell them more. So we're talking about, about it today to be creative. And it's for people that like to be outdoors. Although you can do indoor gardening too. It is an activity that can be peaceful and quiet. And I feel like I'm in my happy place while gardening. And happy place, I think when people talk about happy place, it's, it's just some place where you, where you just don't want to be anywhere else. And it can give you better quality for food for my family. I can do it for the love of flowers and also for pride in growing my own food and your nice yard. And also to be a part of my community. So what technologies can help me garden or learn more? Where, how could you learn more about gardening? I know I really like, um, I have a couple of Facebook groups that I belong to where people can ask questions and um, share things that might be going not right or, you know, maybe doing really well and tips and things like that. Does anybody else have any, any place where they look to for learning about gardening? Any ideas? Uh, this is Sierra. I might use the phone or email maybe to get in contact with somebody like like Christine, who um, is a coworker and friend of mine, and I know that she knows a lot more about gardening than I do. So I might use technology to talk to her about it. Thank you, Sierra. You're welcome. I might use an app that can help me determine 
you know, how to take care of that plant and even sometimes what issues are going on with that plant. There's apps out there that can help you do that. Thank you, Angie. Mm -hmm. Even to identify plants, there's apps for that now. So sometimes my gardening involves me hiking into the woods and bringing plants out of the woods and planting them in my yard. <laughs> so making sure I know what things are that I find in my woods is important to me. Any other ideas about technology? Chris, tell us more. So some things that we thought of are there are podcasts or other YouTube videos that can help you with any gardening related topics. There can also go to virtual tours or take classes on gardening. There are also applications to download on your phone or any other device for planning your garden, companion planting, and more. I know I use the uh, weather app a lot too when it comes to gardening. So thinking about things like the temperature outside and things like that too. So even just simple applications like that can help you be a better gardener. Christine, can I ask a really quick question? Sure. When you talk about companion planting, is that like what plants you can plant together versus maybe some that you shouldn't plant in the same yes. area? So some plants will help repel pests. So for example, planting basil with your tomato plants, planting them right next to each other and help the pests that tend to be on the potato plants be repelled by the basil plant, as an example. So companion planting kind of means plants that work well together. And as Sierra mentioned, maybe knowing what plants don't work well together and might, might actually make your growing not go as well. So, and again, when you have these applications, nobody knows all of the answers. Like, I mean, I've been gardening a very long time and I still have to use applications to double check things just to make sure that I'm on the right track. So I don't know how my grandparents kept track of everything in their head, <laughs> but that was hey, a good question. Thanks, Christine. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris. There are also recipes or instructions online for preserving your harvest. You can also read books or articles about gardening. And all of these are trial and error. You can learn from what you grow to plan better for next time. And it's good to keep a gardening journal. Yeah, and, and again too, you know, those applications online and all of those things, you'll learn that the garden doesn't behave the same way from one year to the next. Maybe one year there might be hotter days or maybe there's, uh, it's more wet one year. Um, those are all things that can kind of uh, feed into how well your garden does from year to year. So your garden doesn't actually look the same usually from one year to the next. There's also seed company websites to learn or order seeds. And don't be afraid to write those companies and ask them for specific instructions if you feel like you don't have all the information that you need. They're usually really responsive because they want to sell you more seeds. So where in the community can I garden or learn more? What do you guys think? Where in the community might you learn? We talked about technology and some of the like the, the resources like magazines and things like that. Where in the community might you learn or garden? You could go to your uh, local community garden. Thanks, Matt. Um, a lot of the community gardens are run by gardening associations or volunteer groups where they're always looking for people to help out. And I know when Matt was on Team Volunteer Project, we got to visit some of the gardens that they had up in Crawford County. So thanks, Matt. Any other ideas? The library. Thanks, Angie. That's a great one because the library, um, so here's some one of the things I do that's a tip. So if I'm looking for ideas for planting and things, the, the library has lots of gardening magazines. So maybe I'm looking for things that are pretty or something that's functional or something that's just different. But if I go into the library and I look through articles, I can take a picture of my phone with my phone of that, that picture of that plant or that little piece of information at the library um, and then just have it on my phone so I can take it home with me. So I don't have to necessarily borrow resources, but I can still use those resources to help me plan. Any other ideas? And thank you, Angie. How about gardening clubs? Gardening clubs, that's a great one. So. One of the powers of groups is that there's lots of people that have lots of experience and knowledge. And so when you join a group, then that helps you to have people like Sierra knows that I know a lot about gardening. So that has, helps you to build um, community so that you have different people that you can ask. I know one person when I was going through my master gardener training, he was an expert at growing flowers inside. I am not great at that. 
So if I had somebody gifted me with a flower that was really like, I was like, oh no, I don't want to kill this plant. I would be, I would call him and I would say, hey, you know, I'm worried about killing this plant. Although I have to tell you guys, there's nothing that brings a plant back from the cat sitting on top of it. So <laughs> that's one of those ones that just never helps, but there's lots of things that can be really helpful. <laughs> So gardening clubs is a great suggestion, Rita. Any other ideas? Okay. Chris, tell us more. So as Matt mentioned, there are community gardens, a thing called the Penn State Extension Office, which is a master gardener program. So the Penn State Extension Office is um, in many counties who runs the master gardener programs. And the master gardener programs are, um, I think they're, I think the, the first, intro to master gardening is usually about 20 hours of instruction. And then you also have to put volunteer hours in when you go through the master gardener program and then maintain doing hours of volunteer service in relation to gardening. And sometimes people come up with projects like they'll be like, okay, we're going to install raised beds in front of the elementary school. That might be a master garden gardener um, that decided to put together some type of a gardening project. Um, oftentimes, many master gardeners are in those gardening clubs, but um, it's a great place to learn. And then 4-H, which is um, in Venango County anyways, is also um, managed through the extension office, which is the county um, Penn State extension, where they um, have all sorts of classes. So I have to say that I probably developed my love for gardening, not just from my family, but because 4-H classes when I was younger were available to help me to learn and be excited about growing and putting things in the fair and things like that. Okay. Chris? You can also visit universities and or community colleges. And again, those places sometimes have classes on gardening that can help you to learn more. You can visit your local greenhouse or gardening center. Don't be afraid to ask the staff at either of those places if they can help you um, so that you can make better choices for yourself. Go to local farmers, your local library, so let's get started with gardening. So the first thing you, you'll need to know is that plants need light, soil, food, and water. So where would be a good place to grow plants for you? So each person's gonna have different places where they might think about planting. And you know, sometimes we don't have good places right where we are. So there's sometimes you can think outside the box a little bit. And what types of plants might you grow? Because you have to grow plants that are going to grow well in the places that you have to grow them. All right. So where to garden? So where would you guys garden? Anyone want to share where you might do some gardening? I don't have a lot of space where I am, so I'd probably do indoor gardening by my window. Thanks, Matt. That's a great idea. I was thinking um, along with the same lines as Matt, I probably would do um, some indoor uh, plants. Those are also a little bit easier for me, um, just accessibility wise, you know, getting to them and taking care of them and that kind of thing. Thanks, Sierra. And that makes me bring up that some of the community gardens have accessible beds. So I'm pretty sure Matt remembers this, but um, one of our self-advocates, Evan, uh, we went, when we went on our um, team volunteer project and we were visiting the community gardens, they had actually developed raised beds with the intent of them being um, handicap accessible so that people that are in chairs, wheelchairs can um, be able to access and garden them. Although when I was looking at them, I was thinking that's gonna be really hard to keep moist the way they made that. <laughs> so sometimes, um, you, you know, you really have to think about things when you're making things more accessible to make sure that you're still going to be able to maintain um, all of the things that you need to do to keep your plants healthy. But there's definitely um, a lot more communities that are making some of the community garden spaces more accessible for people so they can also enjoy gardening. Oops, sorry. Um, did anyone else want to share? Rita has her hand up. Go ahead, Rita. Um, I live in an apartment. It, but I have a nice patio area out front. Gets a lot of sun all day. Nice. Um, so I would probably do plants in pots. So I'd have to figure out what would be tolerant of the sun. Plus I've got deer around and I haven't seen any rabbits, but I've seen chipmunks and squirrels. 
Right. So also thinking about the types of things that you might want to think about that might also want to eat your plants. So, um, and if nothing's eating your plants, I'm not sure they're healthy. So, you know, I don't know. But anyway, um, that's a really great suggestion. Okay. And Bobby, um, wanted to, Bobby wanted to share um, mm -hmm. that he, uh, that he has accessible raised boxes that he does planting in. That's oh. awesome. So kind of what I was talking about, Bobby where you have them raised up so you can you can access them easily. It's great. I'd love to see a picture of that. Love to see. Actually, I've been to your, your house. So uh, <laughs> I think I actually have kind of seen some of your garden. You have a really great little garden. You guys like to eat out of your garden a lot, I think. So thanks, Bobby. Anyone else? I was just going to say I live in the country and we do have a lot of deer and things like that. So if I were to plant, it would be outside, but I would have to take special precautions to keep them out of the garden. Yeah. And, and there, and there's so many different things that people do to try to keep out pests like the deer and the bunnies and things like that. So, um, there's lots of suggestions and it's a matter of trying what works for you, but um, hoping doesn't work when it comes to hoping the deer won't eat or the chipmunks will take one bite out of that ripe tomato the second that it's ripe. Those things happen. So it's not always gardening. Is Gardening doesn't mean you're always getting. <laughs> so, so, and Rita, did you have something else you wanted to add? Well, I had heard daffodils are good at repelling deer. So they don't, yeah. But the, unfortunately with the daffodils, they're only in the spring when they're open. I know. So it's only for those spring things that, that that's going to be helpful for. But th that is one that deer don't like to eat. So usually that's a safe bet if you have a lot of deer. Sometimes you can pick the plants that they don't tend to eat. Uh, I can tell you as far as plants that they do like to eat, they love hostas. Mm -hmm. and they love um, <laughs> euonymus is another plant that they really love to eat. So there's certain plants that they really love to eat. And sometimes you have to think it's okay to sacrifice those plants to those deer because maybe they won't eat the ones that I really want. <laughs> so there's a balance when it comes to living um, places where there's critters and um, not getting too frustrated. So um, that's just part of gardening also. Um, um, and in the picture at the bottom, you can see that that's a, just a raised bed can just be made with um, just a couple of boards that are that then you add the soil and you add your amendments to the soil um, and things like that. But this uh, is in a, a community garden where this picture is taken and there's uh, greenhouses in the background back there. Um, but it, what's important to know is that just because you don't have gardening um, right where you live, like you, you can't think of a way that you could garden or maybe you only have a windowsill and you want to plant big tomato plants. Maybe you could um, ask somebody that has a garden if you couldn't have a small spot, or maybe you can find those community gardens in your community. All right, and I think you guys covered quite a few of these. So go ahead, Chris, take it away. So some examples of where to garden are a sunny windowsill, could have hanging baskets, could use pots and containers, could be creative, raised beds, which somebody mentioned, and it could also be in your garden outside. And you can go to local community gardens. And you can also visit other volunteer activities that in, involve gardening. So now let's talk about when to plant. Yep, it's important to remember that each plant grows differently. So the planning of how to grow that plant is very important. The outside temperature must be warm enough to plant outside. And I want to mention here that you know, there are things that you can plant when it's in the spring, when it's chilly outside, but we're not going to get into that part today. We're, we're going to be talking about starting um, seeds inside that get planted outside. Still important to know when the temperatures might be warm enough outside. We can still get frost in June. Yes, you can. And then my place looks like um, somebody went camping and I throw sheets and lightweight um, fabric over top of my plants so they don't freeze. So... <laughs> by starting your plant growing inside can extend the growing season of the particular plant you are growing. And getting the garden ready can be done throughout the spring. Reading the back of your seed packet or asking questions at your garden center will help you decide on when to start your seeds. And again, if seed starting is intimidating, 
you can always just buy plants to plant instead. So now let's talk about how to plant seeds. First, you must read the packet to find out how deep you should plant your seeds. Make sure you figure out if there are any special instructions and figure out the sprout time that it takes for your seed to grow. Again, I'm sure you're all seeing the theme, read the packet. <laughs> Um, make it sure that you know how deep to plant your seeds is really important because if you plant them too deep, they might not, might not grow. When I talk about the special instructions, there's things sometimes plants need, the seeds need to be put in the refrigerator first. Sometimes they need to be nicked with a knife. Sometimes they need to be soaked in water, but uh, most plants are much easier than that. So um, if those things are intimidating, you might want to pick a different plant that doesn't involve as many steps because the more steps involved in germinating the plants, sometimes there's less that germinate. And, and I say germinate, I mean sprout that actually grow. And the same thing with the sprout time that, um, you know, if it says on the package that it takes uh, two weeks for them to sprout, so you, you're just going to have to keep it moist that whole time without being soggy. But um, it's good to know how many days before you can expect to see those sprouts popping out of the ground because that way you're not, um, it's not as stressful when you have that information for yourself. So using the peed pallets, we will do this together later. You will need to soak your peed pallets in warm water for 10 to 15 minutes. Your peed pallet should be moist, not soggy. You can add more water if needed and pour off the extra. Next, you will need to loosen up the top of your, your peat enough to be able to cover your seeds or seed paper with the so-called peat soil and break up the seed paper by plant and plant by the covering with the soil and water again. You will need to keep, keep it moist until the seeds sprout in a warm, trap-free place. So starting seeds in soil or starting mix. You will need to fill your pots to one inch from the top and moisten the soil and follow the instructions above. So give me one second. I'm going to share a video on planting. Connect and create. Planting seed paper with Master Gardener Christine Breakstone. Hello, everyone. My name is Christine. I'm the Western Regional Coordinator for Self Advocates United as One. I live in Benango County and I am a Master Gardener. Uh, which means I've taken a lot of classes around um, gardening and um, ways to share gardening in our communities. So today we are going to plant our seed paper. So you should have your seed paper um, and you can either use seeds or the seed paper if you don't have the seed paper, but um, you're going to get a pot of soil Put the pot or put the soil in the pot um, to a couple of inches below the rim so that it, um, you have also have room for uh, mulch so you're going to loosen up your soil a little bit and then you're going to take your seed paper and you're going to set it so this about a quarter of an inch which is kind of like the tip of your finger um, below the surface of the soil this and then you're going to just cover the soil cover the seed paper with the soil just so you can barely see it so it's like a quarter of an inch of soil on top of your seed paper so it's completely covered and then you're going to take water and you're going to water the surface of the soil very thoroughly especially over with that seed paper. Just make sure that soil's nice and wet. Let it soak in so you have a wet soil at that point. And then you wanna make sure that you remember what you planted in your pot. So one of the easy ways to make a waterproof marker or for your soil is I take um, just like a cot, this is a Parmesan cheese, but like a cottage cheese or Parmesan cheese or some type of a plastic lid. And you can just cut it very easily to make yourself a little marker. 
it's always a good idea to put the date down. So we're going to write zinnia. And you want the part of the, leave part of it blank at the bottom. So you're only writing at the very top up here. So the date. And what you've planted. So we have a little marker. You're going to put it in the soil in there. And then what I like to do is I will cover this up with a little bit of saran wrap. Just very gently cover it so it helps keep the surface of the soil damp until you get the seeds to sprout. So then once you start to see the seeds coming up, you can take off the saran wrap. And then the seeds are going to come up in the center because of the seed paper. And so once the seeds come up and they're a couple of weeks old, three to four weeks old, usually you're going to see several sets of leaves that are on the different um, zinnias that are going to come up. So once there's several sets of leaves on your zinnia, you can um, divide them or you can uh, what's called thinning and you just leave the strongest zinnia in the pot. So um, you can always try to replant the, the zinnias that you've thinned out um, or just throw them away because you want the healthiest plant in your pot. And then zinnias um, don't like to be frozen. So you would keep your zinnias. Um, once they start to come up out of the soil, you're going to put um, your sprouts in a sunny windowsill so that they continue to grow. Um, until it's warm enough to either plant them outside or enjoy them um, in a pot out on your patio. Um, we'll have some pictures to share of some of the zinnias that are to come. And I hope you um, enjoyed learning about planting seed paper today. Thank you. Keep going and keep growing. Does anybody have any questions? Christine, I just wanted to say that was awesome. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> I'm sure okay. the add some interest to the video. <laughs> Go ahead, Rita. Um, so there could be a lot of seeds on that seed packet. Mm -hmm. And then when the strongest one comes out, that's the one you want to keep, the first one to come up. It's not always, it's not always the first one. It's the healthiest plant. Okay. And, and, when, and, and if you were planting and you didn't have the seed paper, you could make sure that you put the seeds so that you put a couple seeds like every like two or three inches apart if you were using a bigger plant pot like that. Uh -huh. um, so that you, you make sure that there's enough room that if you decide you do want to transplant them and divide them out that you could. Um, but I can tell you that... Um, for a zinnia, if like the size pot that I had there, um, yeah. you wouldn't want more than one plant in that pot for that size pot and okay. prob possibly even bigger. I um, mean, you can see in the picture, there's window boxes. Angie, correct me if I'm wrong. Those are like the window boxes that are like about six inches across and six inches high. And then they're like um, a couple of feet long in the picture. I believe so. This is my mom's picture. So I, yeah. I, I believe so. So, so they can do do very well in not a very big spot. Um, but um, again, if you have too many plants in your pot, it, they'll crowd each other out and then none of them will do well. Okay. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I had mentioned thinning or pulling out the weak looking plants. Um, but sometimes they all look great. And then you're like, I don't want to kill any of them. And, you know, then you can try to transplant them. So, okay. what's your, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, I have a question, Christine. Um, for a person who is a beginner, such as myself, mm -hmm. how would I determine what a healthy uh, growth looks like and uh, versus one that's not healthy? So I'll know exactly which one I need to uh, weed out. 
So you want the, the leaves to be nice and fully developed. You don't want them to be yellow um, and you don't want what's called a leggy plant, which is long and skinny with just a couple mm -hmm. leaves at the top because um, they become weak and sometimes they just die. Um, the other reason too, um, when you're starting gardening, I mentioned seed mix, starting mix. I recommend seed starting mix if you're starting gardening, especially when you're first starting um, to try gardening because there's less chance of there being um, fungus in the soil mm -hmm. and things that might act, it might make it that it might damage your seedlings. So that's one of the reasons why um, I recommend the seed starting mix that you can buy and it's not expensive. Um, but it definitely helps to make sure that there's a better chance of your seedlings making it. I, I, I even have things that don't make it, you know, I mean, so sometimes, you know, gardening is just really um, an adventure because you're not sure what's going to happen next all the time. So, um, and, and Anita, what I would suggest you do is that you take a picture of your seedlings when they come up and then you send it to me or somebody else that you think might know a little bit more. So taking pictures and sending them is super helpful. Um, if you have questions. Awesome. So. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're certainly welcome. Now let's talk about caring for your seed seedlings. And you can see, by the way, in the picture on the right, see the little tiny, like two little round leaf things in the dirt? Uh -huh. Just barely see it right there. That's what your seedlings are going to look like when they come up for your zinnias. Right there, that's what you're looking for. So after a few days, you check periodically for your sprouts daily. And whenever... Whenever the seedlings come up, move to where they they will get plenty of warmth and light. It could be a window or somewhere where the sun. And the seedlings with not enough light get leggy. So a bulb for growing can be hung above your, the plants. And again, that's what that picture is over here, this purple light. That's called an LED light. And so the light, sometimes they're um, LED or they're uh, fluorescent uh, plant light that you can um, buy at the store. And you're gonna wanna make sure that you look to see how close you need to have that light. So for the LED lights, it's like 12 inches and fluorescent lights, it's really only three or four inches from your plants. Um, so even when you use a light, it's important to know how close the light bulb should be to your plants. And it really can enhance um, your growing, um, even for your indoor plants, um, having a, a plant light. Remember to keep the soil moist, not soggy. When your seeding seedlings have several sets of leaves, transplant, transplant them into a larger container. Now we'll get to transplanting seedlings. When your seedlings have several sets of leaves, as we said before, transplant them into a larger container, like a, fi like a fiber grow bag. And you can see over here in this picture over here, the one where there's lots of leaves and then the, the, one, the, the plant on the right up here, it only has a couple of leaves. So when they've only got those couple of leaves, like there's like two leaves this way and then there's two leaves going the other way. So zinnias grow with their leaves coming out at opposite yeah. sides when they come up on the stem. And so you'll start noticing things like whether they're right across from each other or um, alternating those types of things. But when you have a couple of sets of leaves that usually means it makes it means that the plant is going to be strong enough to be able to withstand doing that transplanting. Because if you try to transplant your seedlings too soon, then they have a less chance of making it. Any other questions on transplanting? Now let's talk about caring for your plants. Be sure to check the soil and water daily if needed. The bigger the plant, the more water it will need. When the temperature outside is above 50 degrees Fahrenheit at night, and 70 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, start hardening off the plants. And that's where your weather app on your phone is gonna be really helpful to be looking ahead. You should set your plants outside for several hours, hours a day, building up to all day over two weeks. And that's an approximate um, over two weeks. And again, what that does is it makes sure that your plants adjust to the temperatures of being outside versus your nice in the house, 65 to 70 degree weather that they get acclimated or adjusted. Christine, could I ask a question real quick? Sure. Um, so does that mean, like me, for example, if I am going to choose to continue to have it in the house, do I not need to harden it off then? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's just for, just for when you put your seedlings outside in the garden. Okay. Um, because if you just try to plant your seedlings out in the garden without hardening them off, 
um, a lot of, it's just one of those, one more thing. It's not that if you don't harden off your plants that you're not gonna be successful. It just means your plants have a better chance of being healthy because gotcha. you've given them that chance to, to adapt, to change, to get used to um, the temperature. So if you're doing indoor gardening, you don't have to worry about it as much. And if you're doing patio gardening, like what, what Rita was talking about, um, what's helpful to have is uh, a place inside that if it's gonna be really cold, like all of a sudden, like Rita was saying, sometimes we do get a frost in June. It's not very often, but sometimes we do, that you might put your plants right inside the house instead of outside. And if it's too cold um, after you put them out and planted them in the ground, then sometimes I'll throw things like a light sheet over something or even a bucket um, to help protect those plants from that. I know my husband really dislikes when I'm out there throwing things over all my plants so that they don't freeze. But to me, it's worth, um, it's worth making sure that those plants get a chance to make it. So does that answer your question, Sierra? Yes, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Chris. You should decide where you want to keep them. It could be in a garden, a window box, or to keep them in a decorative pot. And I'd want to mention too um, that if you know you're putting your plants in a pot, there needs to be drainage at the bottom. So make sure whatever your plant is that there's those holes in the bottom so that the water, uh, so that the soil's not too wet and that um, the water can seep out of the bottom. Um, and then if you have a pot underneath it to collect the water, then the plant will actually absorb that water right from that saucer underneath to um, continue to keep that soil moist. Keep track of what works, what you you want more advice on growing and tips in your journal to plan for the next year. Please look at your handout for guidance. You can use it with our activity together. So let's get back to our peat pellets. So planting your seeds paper into the peat pellets. And you can see in the picture there that there's a picture of the peat pellet before it grew and the picture of the peat pellet after it grew. So I'd like for you all to look and check your peat pellets and see if they've expanded. And if you need to add more water or pour more water off. How's everybody's peat pellets looking? It should be expanding some for you right now. When you check your peat pellet, it should be a dark brown. And if you need to, add more water if needed or pour off the extra water. Next, you'll want to open the netting at the top of the peat pellet and loosen up the soil. A pencil works great for this. The seed paper can be broken apart and planted by covering the top with soil from the pellet and place it in a pot or dish and moist lightly. So I'd like for us to do that together. So go ahead and check on your peat pellet. See where it's at, if it's expanded the way that it's supposed to. So when it's fully grown, it looks like this. So your peat pellet expands that big? Yep. Wow. It goes from, I don't have another one anymore. It goes from this big all the way up to this big. Wow. So if your peat pellet isn't quite expanded enough, then again, um, add more water and it's gonna kind of open up a little bit at the top. So you're gonna pull the netting away so that you have room to loosen it up the soil inside. So it's gonna look like this. And again, it, it could be a little bit messy. So it's okay if you pull, if you feel like you need to, to take some of that soil out of the top because you're, if you're not comfortable that you have enough room to put your seed paper piece in there, it's okay if you take it back out and then we're gonna put it back on top. So you wanna have enough room in there for your um, seed paper to go in there. So go ahead and loosen up that top <laughs> and it needs to be deep enough so you can put that seed paper in there. You should have your seed paper and you can break it into pieces. Just make sure that the piece that you're planting is one that you see or you know that, that you can put all of those pieces in the same pot um, if you break them apart or you can um, separate them between your two peat pots if you want, but go ahead and just break, break it up a little bit so it'll actually fit. And if you have a big pot like the one I did on the demonstration, you could just plant the seed paper exactly the way that it is. You just want to, you can break it apart and then you're going to tuck it into the soil. So it's going to look like this. Everyone see that okay? So it's mm -hmm. about 
this far down under the soil so that you're going to have that quarter of an inch or so of soil that's going to be on top. And then you just cover back, cover it back up. And then I have that little bit of extra soil, remember, that I pulled off. But if I need a little bit more to make sure that it's covered up completely, because they, they don't want light for, germ, for um, sprouting. So that's why some seeds have to be covered enough because they don't want that light to actually start growing. Um, and um, then it's just gonna look just lightly tamped back on top of the seat paper. Can everyone see that okay? Make sure that everyone can see that, that it's Christine, completely covered. Christine, when you're, when you're planting seeds, mm -hmm. you, the, the seeds, uh, they need to be, they shouldn't be in the light until they start to, to sprout? Well, what I'm saying is on top of the soil, you want to make sure the soil covers the seed. Oh, 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 oh. So it, it depends. So, so again, that's where reading the back of your seed, your, your packet would be helpful. Um, and, and if you did, somebody gives you a gift like Xenia paper, like Angie did such a wonderful job making our seed paper for us, um, that you can always Google uh, growing directions for Xenias and it'll give you more information. But the, the, the key piece that I want you to remember is that some seeds have to be completely covered with soil in order for them to start growing or they just, they won't do well. Um, and some, again, some plants that, you know, they're a lot hardier than others. So um, zinnias grow pretty easily, um, but some plants um, are not quite as easy to make happy. So that's why I'm saying, make sure that you read that packet. Cause if it says that you have to cover with soil, your seeds, you have to make sure you do that. Does that answer your question, Terry? Thank you. I've been doing it all wrong. That's why I never can grow things from seeds. <laughs> well, that's, that's why we're here learning together is because it, it is a learning experience. And you know, I don't have hundred percent success. Um, the first seed paper that I planted with Angie Earlier this year, um, I'll admit to you guys, it 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 got it didn't make it. So sometimes plants don't make it, even if you're paying attention and you're looking and you're like, "What did I do wrong?" And I know what I did wrong in that case was that um, I um, I didn't use starting mix; I used soil, and so I would have done that differently, I think. And the other thing to keep in mind is that with starting mix, there's no food in there, so once you've got those leaves coming up, you have to start using food. Does anybody have any questions on the activity? on getting your seed paper. And John, this is where I want you to show your seed, your, what you accomplished. You got two of them planted, right? Yeah. So you'd like to show us what, that you got your, um, and then after you've got it planted, again, you wanna make sure that you remember yeah. to mark it. So make sure you have a marker that says Xenia's on it that you put in your, in your pot. And I have it in this kind of a little pot for now. In that same, you know, same kind of a of a container type of thing, so that the moisture goes through the bottom, but it doesn't. Um, it's not going to mold up. And the important thing with your your uh, pellet now is to make sure because you don't want it to be soggy wet. Um, you're making sure that you're watering over that again. So once you've got your seed paper planted, you have to wet that seed paper; it won't start to to grow. So then you're just going to pour the water on top or mist it make sure that it's um, moistened up again. But the amount of seed paper that you put in here, if you put the whole seed paper piece in this one pellet, you're gonna add a little bit more water than what you might otherwise, because you have to moisten up all that paper. So you just have to make sure the seeds are, are moist and damp before they get started. And then um, if you cover it tightly with, with uh, saran wrap, it might mildew. So you wanna make sure that there's some airflow too. So it's, it's keep it moist, but not um, soggy, if that makes sense. Can and I then, hmm, go ahead. A question real quick. Um, sure. I was just wondering, you mentioned making sure the seed paper is moist. Um, is that something that like not soak, soak it, but is it something that you can like pre-wet and then put in the, um, you, a little bit and then put in the soil? So if it makes you feel better, you can always, um, put your seed paper in there and then moisten it before you put the soil back over top so that you feel like you make sure that it's nice and moist. Okay. So that would be, a, that's a good suggestion actually, Sierra. So it makes you more confident, making sure you're wetting that, that seed paper down enough, wet it down before you put the soil on top so that you make sure you feel like you've got it moist enough. 
So any other questions on um, getting your plant started? So again, you know, you wanna make sure that um, as be before the sprouts go up, you don't want it to be too wet so it's not soggy. So when I say not soggy, so when I say soggy, soggy means if I go like this, that the water keeps coming out of it. So if you squeeze it, water would come out. Yeah, that, that would be um, too wet, in which case you wanna make sure you pour off any water at the bottom. And so just making sure that they're not um, soggy wet because that'll create fungus. For your can, you, can you ever just put the seed paper right in the ground? Yes, yes, you absolutely can. But the temperature has to be warm enough during the day and at night because the soil has to be warm enough for that to germinate. So that's usually about 50 degrees. Um, there's things like lettuce and peas that sometimes can grow you know, at, at lower temperatures. Um, but the seed paper can definitely be planted right in the soil outside. Um, I'll probably do that with my other piece that I have um, of seed paper. So that's a really good question, Terry. And I too planted some of the seed paper around the same time that Christine did hers. And I had several right away that came up, but my light, which was in one of the pictures that Christine had showed, was way too close to the plants, I think, and started to fry them. So yeah. it is definitely trial and error sometimes in learning. <laughs> it is, and, and I did research on that, Angie, and it said 12 inches was how far they're supposed to be for the LED light. Yes. So it's just really, you know, there's a lot of, um, like we said, trial and error. And even if you know what you're doing and you're like, I don't even know what I did differently than mm -hmm. I did last time sometimes um, that didn't work, it's, it's kind of like you're a detective to figure out what didn't work sometimes. And that's why it's really great that you can take pictures of things. That's, I really recommend taking pictures and sharing them and, and you know, whether it's a, a social group on Facebook or a gardening club or just with somebody that knows a little bit more than you. And sometimes you can figure out and sometimes you can't. Um, the extension office, the Penn State extension office will actually do different types of tests to help you see if you're on the right track with plants too. So if you find a bug that you're not sure what it is um, you could take a picture or some people capture the bug and they send it off. Um, there's all sorts of things that can elevate the trial and error if you really want to um, try to figure things out. Um, sometimes it's just that that plant, I've tried that plant and it just doesn't want to grow for me. Um, rosemary is one of those plants for me like that where I hadn't had success for years. And then I ended up doing a whole bunch of research on it. And I was just over caring for my rosemary plants and that was too much. <laughs> so sometimes you can go too far with your plants and um, they're just like people, you kind of have to pay attention and read them. You learn that when their leaves start to droop a little bit, that means they probably need a little bit of water. Um, so there's um, paying attention to your plants once they start growing and learning. Uh, for example, testing the top of the soil in your plants. I'm kind of one of those people, I might go someplace and, um, you know, and, and I feel the surface of the soil. So if the surface of the soil is really dry on top, oh, you might wanna water your plant type of thing. But that's how I test to see if it needs water is I feel the soil. And if the soil is dry, just right below the surface, it definitely needs watered. And so it's, it's a matter of paying attention and you learn as you go. Any other questions? So remember to keep your plants watered and fed throughout the growing. Dead head or cut off and save the flower heads as they die to keep the blossoms coming. And that's really, really important. Um, I know like certain things like, um, not just flowers, but like basil, if you let it go to flower, the plant will be done. But if you keep pinching the flower off of your basil, it'll grow into a, almost a tree. So lots of times when you pinch off the, the dead head or, or cut that flower head off, it gives an opportunity for it to grow in two different directions. So um, lots of times it'll help make things bushier um, and rounder if you uh, deadhead your flowers as well. How far down do you uh, cut when you're deadheading? Do you just pull the bloom off, the dead bloom? So I cut down to where um, either I see, like even if you just pinch the tip, the, the actual bloom off, but you'll see a little stem that'll come up. So I usually trim down to where the next set of leaves is, unless I see other stems coming up off. So with the zinnias, it would just be, you know, basically cutting off that, um, that flower tip and that little bit of a stem down to the next set of leaves, but don't okay. cut, don't cut all the way down to the next set of leaves, little, leave a little tiny, tiny little nub. 
Okay. That's what I find helps the best. All right. Okay. And keep the ripened dried flower heads that, because they are the seeds for next year. You can dry and save seeds or make seed. And we're going to show you that. So that's why I also want to make the point so people realize that the seeds come from the flowers. So when you have a flower and it goes all the way and blooms, um, and then it starts to die back, that's where it's starting to form that seed inside the flower head. So um, the same thing like inside your, or inside your vegetable plants, the seeds are inside. So um, making sure that you remove, um, if there's like a, like a tomato plant. So if you're gonna save your seeds from your tomato plant instead of your flowers, you wanna make sure that they can dry properly. Um, and I just use a paper towel or a paper plate and I spread them out until they dry. And then I write on them and save them. But Angie has made a really great video for us. So I'm gonna share that with you guys. In this video, we will learn how to make plantable seed paper. Step one, gather together paper. Some of the best sources include newspaper, junk mail, computer paper, and tissue paper. Step two, tear and shred the paper into very small pieces. Step three, fill the blender half full with freshly torn paper. Step four, pour warm water over paper and fill to the top line of the blender. Step five, blend until there are no more paper flakes left in the mixture. Step six, now stir seeds with a spoon do not blend. Use at least one teaspoon of seeds. Use a seed that will work best for the climate in which it will be planted. Step 7. Pour the mixture into a strainer and get rid of as much water as possible. Use a spoon to press the mixture and squeeze out as much water as you can. Step 8. Spread pulp on a towel. Flatten and dry on both sides. You can spread it into any shape you want. I use cookie cutters to make many fun shapes. You can use a sponge to flatten the mixture and soak up more water. Once both sides are dry, your seed paper is ready to use. Step 9. To plant the seed paper, follow the directions of the seed you are using. And Step 10. Once they are planted and watered, they will begin to grow. Homemade seed paper makes a unique gift that will keep on giving for years to come. It is a useful product that would otherwise end up in a landfill. Seed paper is truly one of a kind. I hope you enjoyed this video on making plantable seed paper. And happy planting! So on the count of three, we are going to say this whole entire, whole entire line here. Go ahead and unmute yourselves. Come on. Everyone ready? Yeah. One, two, two three. three. Knowledge, Knowledge is power. Okay. Self Advocates United as one would like to thank the thousands of self advocates and their families in the past who have paved the way for self advocacy and for everyday lives. And a special thanks to the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council for making this event possible. And thank you for joining us today. So if you'd like, right. to, like to learn so, more or join more events like this, you can contact us in our information right here. And you can also keep up with our events by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter using these handles.